Hello and welcome to this podcast, which is part of a series called Inventing Embodiment. My name is Jonathan Burrows. I'm a choreographer and also a faculty member at the Centre for Dance Research at Coventry University. Last year, my colleagues at CDEM met online once a week to talk, and the conversation kept coming back to the question of how we speak about embodiment. This podcast aims to capture some of the research I was fortunate to hear then. My guest this morning is Rosemary Lee, who is a choreographer and performer, and also a dance researcher at CDARE. Welcome, Rosie. Thank you. Um, can you t- start by telling us a little bit about what you're working on at the moment? Yeah, um, two things really. One is a film that I'm working on with Hugo Glenn Denning and Lauren Potter, which is I'm not sure I know the technical term for what we're doing, but it's photos that we put together and make a film, so stop animation. And with the shutter speed wide open, so you get the traces and the blur of the movement, and almost as if it's the spirit or energy of the movement, if you like, and yet it's going quite fast through your eye. So there's this strange kind of dichotomy between... I don't know, memory and slowness and speed and um, flicker. So we're working on that very slowly when we have time. And then the other thing I suppose that's been most recent a project is Circadian and Threaded Fine, which is the daughter project of Circadian. And basically that's a project that works one-to-one with people of all ages. And they're 24 solos. Each soloist has a score that is the same, but they're able to interpret it in their own way. And then I either place them outdoors or indoors and over 24 hours or over five hours. So the kind of context and way it's presented can change, but the score doesn't change and the person-centeredness doesn't change. In what way might ideas of embodiment be important or relevant or present or maybe not Mm. to the performances that you're busy with? I think it's incredibly relevant actually. If I try and describe the score for the solo with the thought that the score is for an eight-year-old, a 70-year-old or a professional dancer Not that those people couldn't be professional, but I'm trying to sort of give you the sort of span of people that might have be reacting to the score. I feel that the score has to be, it's got to be about intention in the body, intention in the mind, rather than learn this movement. So even though the movement in certain places is exactly the same, for instance, opening your arms a bit like the Angel of the North, and embodying that kind of horizon and breadth through your arms, rather than them having to imitate me doing that, I've got to somehow explain to them what it feels like to do that or what image I'm thinking of that gives the quality of their performance life. So for me, I would say the whole thing is about trying to sharpen the embodiment or trying to make the lived experience of the dance really present for them, really viscerally present for them. And thereby, I think, when the audience watches it, they they see that person tasting the dance. So for me, that kind of is about embodiment of an image or an intention. And I have to subtly change the wording of the image or the intention if I feel someone isn't finding that in their body. A lot of the work that you've been concerned with over many years has been placed not in the space of a theatre or a gallery, but rather Mm. in an outside environment. Does that have a particular impact upon how the work is embodied, both for the performer and for the spectator? Yes, I think it does. And and I was thinking about this today because it's, it's sort of crazy in a way that I'm doing what I do, because by placing it outdoors, one's attention is more dissipated it's almost like you have more space for your thought to travel in or your imaginings to travel in and when we're in a studio the sort of walls hold us in (laughs) like if I'm in the studio I hate it if the doors open because I think an idea is going to escape 
and yet I place the work outside in the wind where everything can escape. Sorry, I'm talking very sort of metaphorically, but it, it's my experience is that when I'm outside, everything kind of floats away from me somehow, so or, or soars quite quickly away. So to hold attention in the body of the performer and the body of the audience member, I need to somehow refer to that sense of expansiveness in the focus of the dancer, as well as make sure that they feel very centered in themselves so they don't feel lost. So it's a strange mix of encouraging a kind of far, far distant focus at times where you're really aware as a dancer of the horizon and of space and distance and time in a very different way to when you're on the stage. It feels to me anyway but also a very grounded, rooted sense of oneself in that place so that the audience feels rooted but also able to see or feel further. You've spoken about the experience of embodiment of the performer in the work, mm. but for you as a choreographer, is there or in what ways might there be an experience of embodiment which is a part of the choreographic imagination and process and feeling? Yes, absolutely. So when I'm trying to work on the score, because of the nature of what I'm doing, because I have to, I'm meeting and working with strangers, I don't have a company that I'm working with long term, I'll have an assistant maybe that really knows my work well that I can talk to in shorthand, but I but I can't do that with, with each group I'm coming afresh. Therefore, I often come with the dance is, there's, the score is made, it's not devised with them. So in, in that devising process of getting the score ready before I meet the dancer that's going to embody that score or inhabit that score, might, feels a better word somehow, I need to feel it even if I'm just sitting in the chair, like as I'm talking to you now, I've had to close my eyes to answer this question, which is interesting. When I'm kind of devising the score, perhaps with an assistant in the room with me, who's dancing it for me, who's a trained dancer, but who's trying to put themselves into the body of a child. And I'm saying, would that make sense? Could they go from this image to this image? Everything is about the feeling of how it is going to feel when you do it while I'm writing it or while I'm composing. So yes, absolutely, it's a it's a felt sense of a very physical sense of whether something is going to work or not through the body rather than separating it out and writing it more from a sort of spatial perspective, which is also there. The outside eye of the audience, for instance, so say I'm imagining choreographing um, one of the squares in square dances in 2011. I will be in that square alone. I'll imagine the flock of women, the 100 women that sweep through that square. I'll imagine where they are. So my outside eye is sort of composing them in space. That's still happening. But I can't separate that from what will the experience be for the dancer of being in that flock. And how will that inform how they do it and how the dance makes sense to them. So, a last question. Do you have any questions yourself or problems with the idea of embodiment or with the way that ideas of embodiment are used in contemporary dance practice and in contemporary dance scholarship? Is there something that you bump up against that you doubt or that, you, yes. that, that makes you think further about what we're dealing with? Bump up against that's such a nice way of putting it. I suppose sometimes I feel words are banded about without much unpicking or stopping to think what we might mean when we use a term like embodiment or release, for example. Embodiment is easy to band about, and I know that it's been a word that people have sort of, oh, you shouldn't use that word anymore. I know that I struggle with trying to put labels on what it is that I feel I'm trying to 
get at in the work and in the performer's experience of the work and in the audience's experience of the work. And I use that term embodiment for want of anything better. So I think I sometimes worry that if I use that term, nobody really knows what I mean. And if I unpick it, I might lose the richness of that sort of foggy place. So in the act of labelling and using language, I'm less worried now as I've got older, but I was particularly worried about 20 years ago about using any terminology for fear that it would put boundaries around the quality of the experience and that we don't have the right words for it. But now I feel more that language is an amazing thing. You just might need to use more words to get there. I think one word might not be enough. And I'm less afraid of unpicking the experience and interrogating it and feeling that it will get lost than I was when I was a younger choreographer. Another thing, perhaps bumping up against it, I guess I have a fear that I hold something really dear and it seems very precious to me. And yet I also can stand back from that preciousness and that sort of treasuredness of, of a lifelong exploration of this place of embodiment. I can also stand back and interrogate it. I feel like I can take both places, but I know that I've still got a secret fear that it will be thrown out, that that delicacy of the experience of embodiment and that mattering so much to someone, at some point that could just have a cross through it, like in an essay or something, a line through it. So I'm afraid of that maybe. I'm not quite sure how to put my finger on explaining more what I mean. Being respectful of people's experiences, however they word it, I guess is what I mean. That feels like a good place to pause. Thank you, Rosie, for sharing those thoughts with us today. It's a pleasure.